So now I'd like to welcome my colleagues Isabel and Derek, who will be joining me today to talk about how to make your social media shine. Can everyone see that okay? I can see that. Yep. Um, yep. So thank you. So thanks very much for everybody for joining um, on a Friday and close to Christmas and we hope we'll make it so it'll be a useful hour for you, hour and a half. Um, so um, I know some of you, I've seen your names pop up on the screen, so hello and hello to those that I don't know. Um, I'm the Promotion and Communications Director at the Bikeability Trust. Um, and Jessica, who introduced herself earlier, some of you might have met in previous webinars, is the communications manager. Um, and then Derek um, is um, a bikeability instructor at the City of York Council, but he also has, well, he has several hats. Um, but uh, thank you very much, Derek, for joining us and giving us your time and participating and, and sharing your expertise in social media. So that's, that's the team that are going to be um, taking you through the presentation. Um, and then I should also mention, we're excited to have another person joining us at the Trust on Monday. She starts on Monday, Nick Colonnett. Um, and she will be um, working specifically on social media and PR, um, and we'll introduce you to her in due course. But um, yes, she's, as I said, she's going to be leading on social media. So she's going to be hopefully doing everything right that we tell you about today. <laughs> um, so um, if I just move on to the next slide, um, just a quick overview. Um, Today, really, hopefully, we want this to make this as sort of interactive um, uh, and um, useful for you as possible. Um, uh, obviously, there are limitations with webinars, but um, as Jessica said, she's done a fantastic job of putting together a presentation that's got Q&As and some interactive activities. Um, so I'm going to start off just outlining um, sort of a very top level, um, some of our sort of main aims and objectives at the moment around social media. Um, we're going to go talk through a, a series of sort of hints and tips for how to get the best from your social media. Um, we'll, sh we'll share some case studies with you um, to so show social media in action and to get your thoughts. Um, and then there's going to be um, a chance at the end for you to sort of over to you and ask you to create some social media and, and um, see, you know, if, if anything that has come up during the webinar, you can apply um, to that thought process. Um, so, um, right. So, yeah, to actually start us off with, we thought we'd actually just try and find out uh, how much you actually use social media at the moment. Uh, just give us a feel, basically, to see how uh, people are using social media. Because uh, right. yeah, you put that up, I can't see what the questions are. Hopefully you can see the questions in front of you before the polls actually come up. So we're just trying to find out if you're professional, you use it for professional, uh, just personally, do you just lurk and look at it, or don't you use social media at all? So it's just interesting to see what people actually use. So we've got quite a few votes coming in already. It's interesting. Right. So yeah, so quite a few of you looking at this actually do use social media, which to be honest is actually a good starting point as we'll find out to go through the, the morning and hopefully for, for the lurkers, you'll see where there's a, a way of actually utilizing social media, and what you're actually doing around bikeability and hopefully for the uh, person who doesn't has never used it, it's just going to be uh, interesting at the end to see how you've actually learned anything about social media and if it's going to be applicable for where you're actually uh, doing your bikeability training. Right, so there the final poll results. Yep, so yeah, 47% people are fans, we've got 28% are lurkers, 22% use it professionally, and there's just the one person who's off the grid at the moment. Okay, shall I move on? Great. And yeah, we know not all of you can vote in um, polls due to kind of restrictions in your areas, um, but hopefully... Mm -hmm. That's, you know, we've got 80% of you there. So that's a really, really useful for us. Right.
So moving on to what our social media looks like, um, hopefully this will be familiar to most of you, but it's useful to um, be able to give you a bit of an overview. So we've got lots of social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and also a YouTube channel. Um, we've got a mix of consumer channels, otherwise known as B2C, and industry channels, B2B. Um, and these are generally the trust channels. So that's why we've got two channels on Facebook and Twitter. It's something that we're actually reviewing internally um, to see whether that's something that we want to do going forwards. Uh, but at the moment, it's because we've got two distinct audiences that we talk to. Uh, Facebook is our most popular closely followed by Twitter, both on our main consumer accounts. Um, and they are then followed by Instagram. Um, and then we've also got a, a small but good following on, on LinkedIn and on YouTube. So if you're not following our channels yet, this slide is your prompt to go and find us on social media and give us a follow, please. Okay, so just a little bit about our strategy, um, and none of this is going to come as a huge surprise to you, I, I imagine. Um, I mean, this is um, obviously not only for our social media, but um, generally broad principles for our, our overall PR and comms um, program as well. Um, obviously, one of our key objectives, um, and we know from um, how important it is to the industry as well for us to be doing this on your behalf, is to raise the profile of bikeability out there. Um, and um, um, hopefully in the last few years, we've sort of continually sort of strive to um, increase that and increase that. And um, as we expand the capacity of the trust going forwards, especially with Nick starting on Monday, um, to focus specifically on social media, we hope to be able to do a lot more of that. Um, and to support our vision. Um, so obviously we, we've got a vision um, to now to hit um, the target of training 5 million people by 2025. Um, and um, obviously social media um, can play a big part in sort of raising the aspirations and encouraging people to get out there and get training and get cycling. Um, and so our key audiences, and these are in no particular order, um, but um, obviously parents, carers, children are um, key target audiences for us. And um, we have got some quite a lot of plans in place for next year to do some social, some campaigns, including social media, to actually reach out directly to those, those audiences and, and engage them and, and increase their confidence in the programme and, and getting training. Um, schools and teachers, another big audience for us. Um, and um, we've got, if you haven't seen it already, there's a, a, a relatively new section on the website around tools for schools. Um, and again, we want to do a big sort of social media push around that next year. Um, bikeability industry, you are obviously key audience for us um, and um, communicating with you using our, 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 all of our communications platforms to ensure that we get um, messages to you in a timely fashion and also, you know, encourage a sort of a two-way debate um, is important. And the wider cycling industry, you know, we've got a lot of very um, supportive partners out there in the cycling world um, and to work with them um, and to um, reach out and engage with them is, is obviously important. Um, so in terms of objectives, again, not, not, no, no real surprises here, but um, clearly we need to be communicating very um, clearly and effectively with those audiences. Um, increasing brand awareness is, is important for us. Um, and uh, educating and supporting confidence cycling. Um, I think, you know, obviously we've all had, it's been a difficult year this year um, uh, with COVID and um, everything else. And, uh, you know, we know that... Um, one of our key roles is to really to, to support the industry and show what hard work you've all put into um, ensuring that bikeability training is um, going on and it's appropriate. And um, so obviously encouraging the confidence um, both with the industry, but also actually in cycling itself. Um, as I mentioned, you know, partnership um, with the cycling industry is really important for us, but we've got a whole range of um, stakeholders out there that um, are really important to help us amplify our messages. Um, and um, as you all know, you know, obviously working in partnership, um, you can do so much more. Um, and, um, you know, there's so many good messages that um, bikeability generates in so many different areas. Um, we can do a lot with a lot of different partnerships. 
Um, and then the last point here in terms of objectives, but um, no least, not by far not the least important, again, no particular order, but promoting bikeability for all. Um, you know, it's, it's absolutely fundamental to us that we make sure that bikeability, when we promote it, um, it really reflects the diversity of all the trainees, all of the people that do the training, um, that, you know, it is an open, accessible programme. Um, and again, we want that message to come across a lot more strongly in, the, in, in our communication and the resources that support that. So that's a sort of very broad, very rapid overview of our strategy. Um, and next year, we hope to, um, uh, this is sort of jumping around a little bit here, but um, we'd like to continue um, delivering webinars um, ne next year um, and um, have a bit more about a sort of broader PR and comms program and, and discuss that with you at some time. So, I'll hand Thanks, over to Jessica. Isabel. Thanks, Isabel. So um, those are our kind of broader, more long-term objectives, but we just wanted to talk about our plans for 2021, which now isn't very far away. Um, and so these include, but aren't limited to, reviewing and refreshing our websites. Um, as I'm sure all of you find, the user journey on our websites could definitely be improved and we want to make content easier to find, particularly for the professionals website. So that is a goal for next year. We want to reach new audiences. Um, we want to be able to reach more diverse groups, more disadvantaged groups, and also improve our send materials and communications. We want to create new partnerships so like our partnership that we already have with Frog Bikes, we want to create more of those to help expand our reach and brand awareness beyond just the bikeability industry. And we want to review, update and expand our resources. This includes things like tools for schools, which we are looking at developing some SEND specific resources for, uh, and also revamping our award certificates, um, which are now a little bit out of date and could do with a refresh. We want to deliver more training tools. So these webinars are an example of that. We want to do more of these and also other resources that are useful to the industry. Um, for example, the letter for head teachers that we created during COVID outlining um, and emphasizing the benefits of bikeability and why that should continue to happen during COVID. And then finally, we want to celebrate achievement at the annual awards. And we want to make this event even bigger and more consumer facing than it's been in the past. So we want to shout about the successes to parents, teachers and the wider community and industry, rather than it just being a kind of something that's only really celebrated within bikeability itself. So those are our plans for 2021. But actually, if you had to choose one of them, we want to know which one you think we should prioritize and which is most important to you. So I'm just gonna launch our second poll. Um, and if you could vote on which one you think is most essential for us to focus on for 2021. So as expected, it's pretty mixed. Um, we think they're all important. So it's good to see that uh, you also think that, but there's more of a preference for reaching more diverse audiences and also reviewing and expanding our resources at the moment. And of course, if there's anything else you think we should be including that's not in this list, feel free to drop that into the chat as well. Um, interesting that the annual awards haven't received many votes, but I, I guess you're saying which is the most important to you. So hopefully the fact that we haven't got many votes for that doesn't mean that it isn't important. But if you've got specific thoughts about that, do, do send them through. Um, and the, the websites, it's, it's, I suppose it's kind of encouraging to see that that isn't, you know, it, it's not too bad for you at the moment. Maybe that's indicating that. But um, certainly we were talking about it just before we started the polls, um, the, the webinar. But um, we, we do feel that the, um, a lot of the professionals materials 
they were talking about it in the context of finding useful resources to support social media. Um, and um, certainly I, I feel that a lot of the content there is, is hidden. Um, so what we, if we can do something to um, improve the navigation for the industry to access um, the relevant materials that, uh, for the professionals website, that's definitely one of our aspirations. So I've just shared um, those final results and thanks Melanie you said it was very hard to choose one in the poll. Yeah, we, um, as, I, as I say, we'll be doing all of these, but it's really useful to know what's important to you and to make sure that we're on the right track with things. And um, so the highest result there is reaching new audiences, which is fantastic. That's definitely an aspiration for bikeability for all and something that we are going to be doing through our marketing and social media. Uh, closely followed by the resources and then also more training tools. So we're glad that this has been useful and, and we'll be providing more of those. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and then, so that's a kind of little bit of an overview on our marketing more generally. Um, but now we're gonna go and talk a little bit more specifically about social media. Sorry, there always seems to be a bit of delay to move to the next one here after the, I've shut the poll down. So hang on, bear with me. There we go. <laughs> um, so I guess one of the common concerns um, is I don't know how to use social media. Um, and um, uh, I think I think the main lesson or the, what we'd like to say here really is that it doesn't matter. Um, you know, there's so many different options to make it work for you, your organization, um, uh, you as an individual to help promote bikeability. It's, it's not a black art. Um, and I think once you dive in there and, and, and get to understand the basic principles, it's, um, you know, it's so easy, it's easy to pick it up and, and it's just really rewarding to find out what a difference it can really make. Um, and, you know, it, you can have a lot of fun sort of learning, experimenting, seeing your successes. Um, so that's, that's really the, the sort of the thing to say that it, it, it isn't a black art. Um, I think if, you know, within your organization, if you feel like you want some um, initial support um, or somebody to help you generate some content, um, there's always gonna be somebody that is there to help and support you. Um, so again, I guess the second tip would be really uh, find somebody who you can, you can participate with and, and, and work together to, to, to generate um, content. Um, and I think the other thing, which is sort of uh, an obvious lesson across all, everything, most things really, but is to, you know, there's, there's lots of stuff out there um, and to look and learn and to see what what has been successful what posts have been particularly successful try and dissect why um, and learn from from what works um, and and try and replicate some of those things you know um, how it's structured and posted so I think um, yeah it's uh, it's not a black art <laughs> yeah this was one that basically uh, I came across uh, where I'm now it's about having the time to create social media posts I think if you don't quite understand it you think it's going to be a very time consuming job to actually uh do that and deliver it and uh, it's just convincing people that actually it's not it's just probably if i look at what i actually do now within the bikeability uh within york it's probably about three hours a term working around the schedule to plan our social media posts uh get them all uh it's, it's just I'll, I'll talk through what we actually do with them later but it's just sort of that planning times there and maybe just check it once a day on the social me media feed we don't say we're going to be checking it every single time responding to everything right away because that if you do you're just going to spend so much time just checking social media i probably been just trying to work it out while i was doing this uh webinar and it's possibly no more than five minutes a day to be honest and that's really pushing it to put a time on it because sometimes you'll I'll just retweet one or retweet something else that we've actually seen uh on the on the social media side because what we do is we actually follow quite a few people who do uh road safety work as well because that's the other brief I've got not just bikeability but road safety and we don't create those we use what the police do and 95 alive in in the north so using those and it's not reinventing it it's using what's actually out there so and it's that's how we really got the time down to basically about three hours a term for actually doing the creation of social media posts the other side of it as well my background isn't in social media 
it was in social care catering. So I've come in to it from probably being the uh, fan type of person for doing it and persuaded my bosses in Leeds. That's what we, sorry, Leeds, sorry, I work in York now. It were in York, that's what we uh, have to be doing just to raise the profile of what we do for bikeability. And that's really where it's gone on from over the last year, to be honest. And just doing that little bit of time around the bikeability training that I do literally in the downtime between the two training sessions a day. Thanks, Derek. And the third one that we most often hear, um, and I've heard this throughout my career from all levels, from staff to CEOs, is social media doesn't make a difference. But it does, and the numbers are huge. Four billion people now, which is over half the planet, use social media every single month. And two million people are joining social media every single day. A typical user spends 15% of their waking day on social media. So it's a huge opportunity to reach your audience in ways that you just couldn't reach them otherwise. And it's also particularly vital now. Uh, we've seen massive increase in people joining social media as a result of COVID, particularly in the older demographic, as they've joined social media in order to keep in touch with loved ones um, whilst the pandemic has happened. So it's huge. The numbers are unbelievable. And to be able to reach just a really small percentage of that means that you can reach a brand new and wider audience. And it also works. So in my previous experience, I worked as marketing manager for Abbey Croft Leisure, which was a chain of not-for-profit gyms across the east of England. And we did a Black Friday offer about four or five years ago now. Uh, we advertised it only on social media and we generated 300 gym memberships over just three days. And our digital strategy changed our sales from almost 90% in centre to 50-50 online and in centre. So we really could evidence that the social media drove sales and drove a change in how users were buying gym memberships. And it's something that we can apply to bikeability and cycle training as well. So now we want to ask if there's any other concerns that you often hear or that you have about using social media. Um, if you could use the Q&A function uh, to put any of those in, then uh, we'll see what we can do to answer those. We've got lots of questions about badges and certificates coming in, which is uh, not, not quite um, relevant to this webinar, um, but has come through as a, as a kind of common question throughout all of the webinars and it's something that we know that we need to review um, so there's lots of demands for people who want to purchase either more certificates or more badges um, and um, if i if i jump in for sue's yeah, question please. um uh, apologies that, that no one's got back to you yet i will chase that one up um and uh get someone to get in touch with you asap Um, great. So thank you, Patrick. So we've got a question here about whether there's a particular um, app that is useful for creating social media content. Um, yes, yeah, so we'll come on to this later. Um, and um, we'll talk about some of those some of those platforms that we can use. Derek's going to come to that later if we're happy uh, to wait until then. Uh, we've got a question from. Andrew saying, why do bikeability Twitter feeds not follow back all schemes who follow them? Um, we They should. <laughs> One of Nick's uh, roles when she comes in will be to review this, review who we follow um, and who follows us back and, and do a bit of an audit of those channels. Um, but it's something that um, just, just needs reviewing, like everything, like your email subscriber list um, and like any other data that you have. It's something that you need to review every kind of few months or so, and we need to do that at the Trust. And also an interesting question from Adrian about strategy to target the right audiences, um, i.e. not just sending stuff to friends and families. Hope, hopefully, we're gonna come on to our top 10 tips next. Uh, so hopefully, 
that will answer that one. Um, but if you have any more questions at the end, Adrian, um, we're going to have plenty of pauses to uh, to be able to have some questions and answers. So, um, but hopefully these tips coming up next will help. On the actual uh, chat as well, Sally's put a question in about local authorities having to go through the comms department. Yeah, uh, that was a challenge I actually had in York as well. Uh, although the section I have had their own Twitter account, it still has to go through the comms department. You've got to follow their guidance as well. But there's a sort of the disclaimer at the top of the Twitter account that that's how they've got around it in York is basically says all the viewpoints are of the road safety team and not necessarily of the City of York Council type of thing. So that is one way around it. Uh, if you if you can actually get one set up within a council. I do know all councils do vary. I've been worked for another northern one previously and anything that went out through any media, social media, had to go through the comms team. So I understand that side of it, Sally, as well. The other side with that, uh, going through your comms team is just make sure you keep giving them the good messaging because that's what they did with the service I did in Leeds and they always came to us when there was something they wanted to balance within the council to have a good message going out so just be the go-to people for good messaging on that not quite social media side but just a tip for you okay <clears throat> Any more Q&As or should we move on? No, if we move on for now, please. Um, so, yeah, as Jessica said, we're now going to sort of move into the hints and tips sections. And we've split this up into two segments um, of discussion. Um, so five hints and tips and then a Q&A and then we'll go into another five hints and tips. Um, so um, Derek and Jessica are going to cover um, the following. Um, and if uh, at the end of the 10, you've got any others, do share. Um, but uh, we, th we think we've kind of um, hit some of the top ones. Um, choose the right channel, a photo, the importance of a photo, um, the importance of the hashtag tags, um, encouraging others to talk about you, um, and obviously joining the conversation. So I'm going to move on now to choose the right channel. Yep. So um, as, as we mentioned earlier, we've got lots of different social media platforms at the Trust, um, and that's about using the right channel for your audience. So for example, our Facebook page, uh, Facebook tends to be great for women in particular, families um, and also you can target really specifically using uh, Facebook ads and targeted spend. Um, looking at, I had a little look at our bikeability Facebook page, 37% are women aged 35 to 44 who like our Facebook page uh, and the number top three cities were London, Birmingham and Manchester. Um, so that was interesting and then if you're looking at other channels, Twitter is, is much more a conversation. Uh, it's much quicker by its very nature. Um, so that's more for kind of short, sharp messaging. And Instagram is much more image focused. So it's more about the image than, than the caption. Um, so when you're posting on social media, what we'd advise is that you don't put the same post on all of them just as a copy and paste. You tweak them slightly, bearing in mind um, what the audiences on those channels are and which part of your post that they're really interested in. Right, a photo's worth a thousand words. Uh, yeah, uh, what I've got on here is basically a couple of photos. One on the left is another uh, social media uh, event I look after, Nutrition and Hydration Week. It's something been running for 10 years in health and social care, and it is a lot of it's done through the impact of photos that was the one you see is actually somebody's uh cake winning entry i think in the blackpool and health trust uh so it just gets an impact of, of what the the photos can actually do the one on the uh, right hand side is the one that we just created for bikeability level two in york uh had to do that that follows the design brief you'll see our older version earlier and it's just having Basically, pictures have the impact on social media. Yeah, I might have some text above it sometimes, but it just gets that photo there. The images do have to be clear. 
Uh, because of some of the consent issues, some of you might actually have about photos for bikeability. Yeah, there is a photo library on the professional uh, bikeability uh, website. This is where these three are actually pulled from. Uh, the other thing in the Q&As, uh, Derek Mullard had actually queried about the diversity in social media. And it's one of the conversations we actually had uh, in the promotions and communications group on Tuesday about actually getting more photos that are actually more representative of cycling across the UK and actually just developing that resource a little bit further. So that is something that, that we've actually just talked about this week, Derek. So hopefully that answers your question a little bit. Uh, what I do as well on the one on the right-hand side, I've actually used a free computer resource called Canva to build uh, the graphic up. It just has a format in the photos you can drop in. You can put whatever text you want in. Obviously, this one's a York uh, format as well, having the outline of the city at the bottom. And again, it's just working with what styles your your, uh, your organisation has to actually uh, get the message out there. There's also Pixabay for photos as well. Uh, so that's a, another format to actually get photos in. It's getting the high quality resolution shots, not just doing screenshots, which sometimes don't come out as clear once you actually uh, put them back onto social media. So it's just making sure that photos there. Having a photo one to me makes a massive difference in anything that you're actually promoting on social media because it draws the eye to it and it's to try and keep it as simple and as clear as possible. Jessica? Great. So I'm just popping that into the chat as well for everybody, but we'll um, put a link next to the webinar. It's Canva, um, which is a free platform for graphic design. And then Pixabay is also free and um, offers um, copyright free images. So another thing is don't forget hashtags. Uh, so hashtags are great, particularly on Instagram and social media, but you use them slightly differently. So on Twitter, hashtags are used to look at trending items. Um, and also you'd only use a couple in a tweet uh, because you have those limited characters, um, but it helps you reach a wider audience and join conversations, which we'll be coming on to later. Instagram, you can use up to 30 caption, uh, 30 hashtags. So I always recommend people use 30. If that's the maximum, use them all. Uh, and what's useful to do is to use a mix of really broad terms and then niche terms. The broad terms will help you reach a wider audience. And then the niche ones will attract real dedicated fans to your account. So here I've got an example uh, from my own Instagram. Um, and you can see how on the right, the reach, most of the people have seen it because of the hashtags. Um, the others have seen it because they follow me, but actually the majority have found it through hashtag search and it coming up as suggested on their feed. And so I've used a variety of hashtags. Some are very specific, such as um, Cambridge, Instacam, uh, Cam Local is a local magazine. So this image was then picked up and published in that local magazine because I used that hashtag. Um, and then also some are much broader, hunting, visit Britain, um, those kind of ones that are, are still specific and relevant to the, um, to the image but a little bit broader. And um, we've just got a question from Sue here about hashtags that we should use to specifically promote bikeability. We just use hashtag bikeability. Um, so if you can use that, then we will pick that up. But also go and take a look at our Instagram because we have got 30 hashtags like this that have a mix of things that are very broad, like cycling, and then also very niche, like bikeability or cycle training. Um, so they're a really good resource to be able to, to broaden who you reach and get out to um, wider audiences who might not yet follow you. So we can go on to the next slide. Thank you. Yeah, it's the, the encouraging others to talk about you. And interestingly, one of the questions has been uh, our bikeability following all the schemes. That will be key going forward uh, because that's where we can actually start to build up and link it all to bikeability. If you look at the uh, 
tweet on the left hand side that we did from York. Uh, it's just generally how I build the tweets at the start of the term, get them programmed in. It, it's literally one for the road safety side. We're going to be out and in the part of York as we train bikeability. There's the the link there through to bikeability. So hopefully, if they're following us, they'll retweet it and it then starts to build that up. But also, I include the school one as well. So the school can then retweet it. They've got a different audience. And it's just trying to get others to actually keep retweeting it. And it just gets gets your message out to a, a wider audience. You can see the one on the right where bikeability have picked up Archbishop Academy's. Uh, year threes with our certificates and just retweeted it. And again, it just builds up what we're actually doing. And hopefully as we move forward, when Nick is in ports, we'll be able to do this a lot more and it will get more people talking about bikeability as it will actually start to get bikeability more into everybody's uh, social media feeds and a lot wider and it starts to build up the numbers that are following. Uh, it just gets that wider message out. So, that that's what we're aiming to do by just making sure we actually do that. All right. Uh, so it's just making sure you have those in there. Right, Jessica, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Derek. So, and then the final one of these five points, and then we'll, we'll come to the Q and A. So if you pop any questions that have come up so far into the Q and A, I can see a few in the chat. So if you could put them into the Q and A, just so we don't lose them. That would be great. Um, so the final point for this section is to join the conversation. Um, so again, it's about being social and using things that are already in place to jump onto and piggyback onto and then broaden uh, your reach. So um, it's something that innocent drinks are great at. It works for their brand to be able to get into conversations with slightly random things. Um, their Bake Off tweets always go viral. People always follow them. It's not directly selling their smoothies, but it's helping build their brand. So it works really well for them and it might work well for your brand. Um, but if you're in doubt, stick to things that are really relevant and specific to what you do and what you're selling. So the Cookie Monster always tweets on National Cookie Day. And of course he would. And we tweeted uh, on Cycle to Work Day. Again, it's really relevant to cycling, um, but it's a bigger conversation. You're reaching commuters as opposed to children who are doing cycle training. So it's helping getting the word out about our brand. And um, yeah, we asked Michael to take a photo as he was going into the office when he was still with us. Um, and he took a, took a nice little selfie and tweeted it. And as you can see, it, it went down well on Twitter. Um, so the best way to kind of find these days, you can either be really reactive and see what's trending that day, but obviously that's quite resource heavy. So there are loads of national event days calendars online. So if you search for national event day calendars, lots will come up and then you can forward plan um, and put some of those posts in in advance so that when those days come, you prepared and uh, you've got some posts to uh, jump in on the conversation. So now, as I say, we're going to come to a QA and a uh, to see if you've got any questions. Um, we've got one. So we've already answered, Suze, about any hashtags that we should use specifically to promote bikeability. Like I say, uh, use hashtag bikeability. We track that using our um, social media software. But also um, take a look at, at our Instagram and see which hashtags that we're using. And we've also had a hashtag in the past for like cycle more uh, promotions and that. And there are separate hashtags for those that will come out from time to time just to link specific promotions into bikeability. And again, that they're tracked as well. Um, and then we've got our hashtags just for Twitter and Insta, which is a great question from Kate. Um, they're not. Um, it used to be that using hashtags on Facebook was totally pointless, but actually they can work. But they're not super effective. If you think about personally, when you scroll a Facebook feed, you don't really see posts come up because of a hashtag. Um, so they don't really work in the same way. Whereas on Twitter, you might have some posts suggested to you because they're using a hashtag that you've used or you've shown an interest in. 
So really, that's the difference. Um, so we wouldn't put hashtags into Facebook posts unless it is for a specific campaign, like Derek said. So we're just looking to get that everywhere. Um, but we would um, then, yeah, just, just use hashtags on, on Twitter and Instagram mainly. They also kind of work on LinkedIn. Um, but um, And it does suggest that you use hashtags when you create a post on LinkedIn. Um, but again, it's um, kind of an additional thing as opposed to a necessary thing. Um, we've got another question about hashtags. So I'm happy to take that. Uh, the difference between an at and a hashtag. So an at is for an account. Um, so if you at somebody, uh, you are tagging in their specific account. So if you at Bikeability UK, we would get a notification that we had been tagged. If you use a hashtag, we wouldn't get a notification because that hashtag isn't owned by anybody. That hashtag is just a marker uh, that you can use. So we track bikeability, the hashtag using our social media software, but that's because we actively choose to track that. We don't own that hashtag or control that hashtag, whereas we do own and control that account. Hopefully that makes sense. And Jessica, Sue's got a question there about including some hashtags in the next newsletter. Um, I'm, I'm sure we can do something in the next newsletter that um, includes, um, you know, highlights a link to the page um, that summarises this webinar and some of the key lessons that have come out of that. So, yeah, I'm sure we can do that, Sue. Yeah, of course. And uh, then we've got we'll move on after this one, I think, um, just because we've got five five more points to cover um, and then another Q&A opportunity. But Melanie's asked, how important is it to understand analytics and that it's an area that uh, she feels weak on? Um, I think it is important if you're at that kind of more uh, pro level, if, referring to the poll earlier. Um, it's, a, it's a great thing to be able to look at and analyse. It can be a bit of a rabbit hole if I'm honest. Uh, so really what you want to look at is you want to look at who your key demographics are, where they are to make sure that that is where you want them to be from. Um, and also it's always useful to look at what time of day um, or days perform particularly well. So those would be the key areas that we would focus on on social media because that then helps you future plan your forward posts uh, and build on that success or change what's not quite worked in the past. If you're looking to go a bit more in depth about things like analytics, uh, both a website called Buffer, B-U-F-F-E-R, and Hootsuite, are both social media scheduling platforms. So they've got excellent blogs um, with really great in-depth resources teaching you about analytics, how to use them, how to make the most of them. So I would recommend going and looking at those, which of course will uh, we'll link as well. Yeah, and the other thing you mentioned was training, Melanie. I've done social media now for about 10 years, but I've never had any training in it. I've just picked it up as I've gone along seen what other people have done and just learnt by going along through it on the campaigns that I've actually run. So, yeah, and it is difficult to find training on, on that. So I've just had to learn literally as I've gone along doing it. So it doesn't really answer the question, but that's how I've actually developed what I've actually done on social media. Great. So um, should we move on to the next section of five hints and tips? Um, so yes, yeah, just a summary again, um, Jessica and Derek will run you through these, but um, get your audience to do the work, exclamation mark. <laughs> um, uh, and um, your staff, your strength. Um, I think that's particularly true in our industry, actually. We've got some amazing stories that, and, um, to share. Um, people love personal, um, that's true across the board, um, planning ahead and um, making things competitive. So I will hand over to Jessica. Great. So, yes, getting your audience to do the work. So as we were putting this together, we were quite aware that we didn't want to chuck loads of things at you that take up a lot of resource and a lot of time, because that is often what stops people using social media to its full extent. Um, so a great way to do that is to get your audience to send in photos for you. Uh, so to the left, I've got a screenshot from um, 
visit Cambridge's Instagram, which is, I should have said, is who I worked for uh, previous to this role, uh, the tourism board in Cambridge. And what we did was we used people who tagged us in our photos and also used our hashtag to then repost to their photos on our Instagram feed. So actually, I think only one of these I took myself. All of the others are people's photographs that we have reposted. It worked really well in two ways. One, there's already so many beautiful photos of Cambridge. It was a waste of resource to go out and take more when there were so many just sat on our doorstep. And then secondly, people wanted to be tagged and featured and they wanted the promotion of being on the official tourism board web on Instagram. So that encouraged more content in itself. And so we saw a massive increase in tags and uses of the hashtag once we started this process. And for me, I could log in on a Monday morning, see what photos we'd been tagged in recently, which ones I liked, which ones were good, and then use those to create my feed for the week. We kind of use this same principle with our bikeability summer competition, which hopefully some of you saw. Um, oh, we've lost Isabel. <laughs> There's a slight issue. Um, I'll keep talking and hopefully she comes back. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we needed more family images uh, to promote the new family module and um, so we as the summer competition asked for people to submit their photos of them enjoying cycling as a family um, and so we uh, did that and posted that out and uh, it worked really well. Um, we know there's lots of work to do. Uh, somebody asked earlier about diversity and absolutely the photos in this, when I can get it back up, um, aren't as diverse as they should be. And it's something that we're really striving towards. Um, but it was still much more real than any kind of stock photos or kind of fake images in that kind of set up way. Um, so it's uh, definitely kind of connected with people much better. Um, if you just give me a moment, I will get the presentation up and share it so that we uh, don't yeah, have I'll, too much of a delay. Yes. Uh, yeah, Trace is asked, worried about getting it right and feeling embarrassed. Yeah, it is. If it doesn't work, you don't do it again. It's simple as that. I've done stuff on social media. I thought, yeah, this would be great. And it's really turned out not working. Just, just don't do it again. It's just, it has been as simple as that. Uh, and you'll see uh, on the next slide, it's one of the campaigns I do. It's Nutrition and Hydration Week. And it's just three of us who do it. A, a couple of uh, caterers and a nurse, to be honest. Uh, we actually set it up 10 years ago just to get positive messages out. And we just tried to see what worked. We've tried all sorts of stuff over the last decade. And some stuff's worked, some stuff hasn't. And if it's not work, we just don't do it again. Uh, we've not really got egg on our face too much, but uh, hopefully that answers that question. And there's another one just on the chat uh, about consent. And it was about consent for photos. And yeah, that is something we had a chat just before we actually came on, on live. And I think it's something that Jessica can point to after where there is some information on how to get consent uh, for children's photos in particular and different ways of doing it. So we can get that information loaded up, can we, Jessica? Yeah, so your um, local authority or your training provider, grant recipient, should have consent forms um, in place that you should be kind of briefed and know how to use. We have also got some template consent forms as the Bikeability Trust, which are available on the website. Um, but like we say, we'll, we'll link those below the recording of this as well. Um, and can always send that out in the newsletter if that would be valuable as a reminder for people. Um, just if you need something to set up, we know that we've got a few few new instructors and providers on today. So um, if you need that support, um, have a look on the website or just email contact us at bikeabilitytrust.org and uh, we can help support you with that. Yeah, so and hopefully you, know, you can see my screen, Derek. Yeah, I can do now. Thanks, Jessica. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, basically, uh, on, if you look at the photos I've used, I've used uh, the photos from Bikeability Trust because it's just easier uh, that way to do it, to pull them off there because they're actually ready done. 
and we weren't too worried about it. In fact, I was having a chat with somebody in York yesterday about photos, and then we realised it's sometimes difficult with consent. All you need is the wrong child to be in the picture, and it, it does cause you a big problem. So just be aware of that side of it. Right. Uh, yeah, the staff are your strength. Yeah, the people out there who do the role for you are the people who can actually uh, promote your service, and they're the ones who will actually see things on the front line. Uh some things like the Bikeability Trust picked, have picked up on was like Cycling uh, UK, basically one of the top uh, 20 uh, cyclists was N Nikki Sir, one of the instructors from Outspoken, really promoted that. It's just finding where there's a link to promote. On a more local level, you could be looking at what your staff actually do. Do they go above and beyond? Are you doing some particular courses, some particular training? On the right-hand side, that's from the, the other thing I actually do a lot on social media for, is Nutrition Hydration Week. Uh, and again, th this is typical of the uh, social media we'll see during the week. It's about the health trusts or the social care people promoting what the work their staff actually do. This one, it's dietitians. And if you notice on this one, it's just got the hashtag on. It doesn't copy uh, the week and it uses a hashtag. And people telling my big bugbear is making sure people use the right hashtags on Twitter so we can find them and don't create their own. So if we do share hashtags through bikeability for certain campaigns, just use those hashtags because it makes it easier for the, the communications teams within bikeability to find them and actually just reshare yours. Uh, <clears throat> on the <clears throat> Nutrition Hydration Week, yeah, we'll probably reach about 10 million people uh, each week in March with it. So and it's just getting messaging out there. And that is through literally retweeting what we've had sent to app Nutrition Hydration Week or a, or a hashtag on. So that's how it's done. And that's how we've actually built up the following and just really just created uh, the week as it was. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's really what I wanted to cover on that slide, Jessica, if you can get Thank the slide you. back up. Uh, I've just taken them down because we've got Isabel back online. So I'm hoping that she can share her screen. Um, um, yep. Carry on. I, I've lost that. I'll have to open it up again. I'm sorry. Apologies, everyone. If you carry on for a minute, Jessica, um, okay. and I'll bring it back up. Um, That's fine. I can keep it. Um, okay. I can, I can just share the presentation, it's not a problem. Okay, so people of personal, uh, this I have to say is not a bikeability approved method of cycling, um, but when we were at Visit Cambridge, it went down very well. Um, so going on from the user generated content that I was talking about earlier and uh, Derek talking about using staff, um, people just love personal stories and another great way to be able to add lots of content to your account um, and kind of get other people to do the work for you is to get people to take over your channels. So we did this uh, at Visit Cambridge where we approached predominantly influencers or photographers or kind of those kind of creatives in Cambridge and asked them to take over our social media channels for a week. Um, and it worked really well because, as you can see, we got all different personalities um, and all different walks of life uh, to kind of take over our Instagram and provide a different perspective that you just don't get when you just have one person doing it all the time. Um, and it's something that we want to do at the Bikeability Trust. Um, so if any of you are inspired by this webinar or, uh, you know, run run your own accounts and want to increase your brand and, and get some promotion, co contact me on jessica at bikeabilitytrust.org um, and you can take over our channels um, and we'll get a different voice, a much more kind of regional focus um, that we know that we need to do more of. Um, and yeah, we'd, we'd love to have you. So, but also you can do it with your staff and your teams, have an instructor take over your account for a week and give a real kind of, on the on the ground view of what cycle training's like and um it will go down really well and connect with people right it is to me it is about planning ahead uh yeah there is some instant stuff you can actually do on social media but the big part of it is planning ahead 
and it's getting things into the diary that's actually scheduled to actually come out at different times of day, working out what your customer base is, who you want to actually impact. Uh, different things you can use. You can actually plan messages on Facebook. You can use TweetDeck, which will do your tweets. Or if you want to combine things together using Buffer or Hootsuite, actually will actually enable you to do that. Timing's key who you want to reach at different times. Uh, it might be different messages. You want to reach different people. We've looked at it uh, through Road Safety York when we do different tweets. So we'll aim tweets at drivers. So they tend to go out morning, lunchtime, and at uh, early evening. Where if we want to reach the school gates, we'll actually put tweets out about a quarter to three. Because you know, we know and we've seen mums checking the their iPhones when they're actually waiting for the kids coming out of school gates. So we put a lot of bikeability tweets out uh, in the afternoon between about quarter to three and about 10 past three. So we've worked out that's where we want to reach people. And by being able to actually do it and plan it, we plan hours in York on tweet deck, putting them onto tweet deck just enables me to be in wherever and get them planned on there. On the nutrition and hydration week, lockdown one was great for me because basically I did the years planning for tweets. So I just sat there and planned the tweets right through to next March. How I plan tweets, yeah, there will be some other stuff comes up in between, but it just enabled me in a bit of downtime there to say, right, we're going to do that. It's on and it's put to bed. That was literally for the next 12 months. So you can actually do that by planning ahead with, with different things when you get a bit of quiet time to actually do it. So, and it is key just to think about what you actually do. Back to you, Jessica. Right. Thanks, Derek. And then our final tip, um, we could go on, but we wanted to keep it to 10. Uh, it's always a nice number. Uh, is to make things competitive. Um, it's a bit of a no-brainer. It's one of the easiest ways to help grow your channels and uh, improve who you reach. Um, so I've ran lots of giveaways in the past, um, but bikeability um, is a little bit different, as you know, because you don't have a clear product. So unlike in other roles where we would give away a gym membership or we would give away um, something from a business in Cambridge, cycling is a little bit different, but you can still give away that experience. Um, so that's why I've got this uh, example here of a stunt driving experience. But actually, as providers, if you offer private one-to-one -one or family modules, that could easily be a prize. And actually it becomes a bit more of a money can't buy prize because it is such a unique and special experience that people may not invest in otherwise. But once you make them aware that it's an opportunity, um, you're spreading the word of that paid for service, which let's face it, helps everybody because you'll generate more income. Um, but also you are kind of just showing the breadth of what you can do and, and engaging in that way. Um, the important thing about it is to make it relevant to your audience. So you could tomorrow give away a hundred pounds Amazon vouchers, and I'm sure you'd get a lot of reach and I'm sure you would uh, get a lot of entries, but whether those people who entered would stay around, probably not because they're probably more interested in the Amazon voucher than they are in your cycling content. So that's why we partnered with Frog Bikes. Um, in January, we're going to be doing another giveaway um, and that will be a design your own cycle jersey. So it's going to be an interactive competition. And then the winner will get their own designed jersey printed for them by Frog Bikes. And they'll also win a bike as well. So we know that that's going to be relevant for our audience. But also by using a bigger brand like Frog, we're going to draw more people in as well. Equally, if you want to also draw people in who are perhaps not cyclists, that was the logic of our family competition. So we wanted to bring people to our page who had in started enjoying cycling as a family over lockdown predominantly, but maybe weren't aware of bikeability or cycle training. And that's why we chose to give away a Love to Shop voucher. So it wasn't a kind of hardcore cycling prize. It wasn't um, anything equipment focused. It was something that any family would find use of. Um, so that's why we chose something that was quite different to try and attract a more diverse audience than the kind of uh, hardcore cycling fans. 
So it's about kind of thinking about what the purpose of that competition is. Are you wanting to attract more people who are already, you know, who should be fans but aren't because they might just not have seen you yet? In which case, do something very relevant. Or are you trying to reach a new audience, something more diverse, and then think about what would be a good prize for them? So I can see that we've got some more questions coming in, which is fantastic. Um, so um, we did have a good question from Patrick uh, in the chat um, that was, do you have some kind of agreement for takeovers and a template? So this is about the uh, Instagram takeovers that I talked about. Um, so what we did at Visit Cambridge, but you could amend this as, as required, was um, we had a short list of people that we wanted to work with and then we reached out to them. Um, and asked them for a set number of images. Um, I think it was six with the captions and the hashtags and a deadline of when we needed those by um, and got them booked in accordingly. So there was quite a strict uh, brief in terms of number of photos and content, but actually that could be anything that they wanted. So we left them very much free reign to do with what they wanted, but we said it will be six posts and we need it by this date. And I think that's the key, giving a kind of enough structure so that people know what you want from them and you don't have to go back and come back and go back, um, but equally giving them the flexibility to make it their own because at the end of the day, if you're going to be really restrictive about what they can post, you might as well just post it yourself. <laughs> Um, I, I see Jan's got a question there about um, if Bikeability has an annual plan, it can share of major bike events during the year. Um, so I'm sure that's something that we can compile and share. Yes, yeah. that's, that's absolutely fine. We, we've got our sort of internal social media plan with those dates in it. So we will create an external version. Um, and then we've... Oh, and we had a question from Colin earlier as well about um, consent. Um, so additional to the consent forms and when you're taking photos, consent of reposting things on social media. Um, so, and I think Melanie answered this and I agree with her. Um, we generally take the approach that if they tag us or use our hashtag, um, that's implicit consent. Um, so because they're actively tagging us in that, so therefore... Uh, there is that expectation that they've agreed to regram um, because if it's a public account, it's out there on social media anyway, they've already given consent for it to be on that platform. Um, if you wanted to be a bit more stringent about it, then you could reach out to those posts and say, we really loved your photo. Would you be happy to give permission for us to repost it on your feed? Um, it's something that I know Visit Britain have recently brought in, um, but it's really quite resource heavy and time consuming. So it really depends on whether you've got the resource to do that. Um, but it may be that some of your local authorities in particular would ask you to do it that way around, which is absolutely understandable. Yeah, yeah. and this put a question yeah. in uh, about going off piece sometimes with social media and how you best manage the scenarios. If it's getting really sticky, I'd actually just take it offline and say, look, contact me direct or whatever, do it that way and try and answer answering it offline so you don't, you're not too controversial about anything that you're actually putting out there that can be misstrewed as some of the type of information that's linked to yourself or the organisation you work for. That's how I'd look at that one. I think the other thing to say about that, and it's something that, that um, the trust have got, and perhaps we should be sharing a, a sort of version of this with the industry as well um, as background, is to have your own communications line document. So that, um, you know, I, I completely agree with what you're saying, but in just in more general terms, in terms of those sort of issues coming up from PR and comms point of view, um, to have that comms document that everybody in your organisation is clear on, so that actually across the board, you're all, you're all absolutely saying the same thing um, about issues that might be slightly controversial. 
And then uh, we've got one question from Colin that Benjamin's going to answer for us. Sure, yes, about does it matter if you use photos or videos of people doing something that isn't part of the bike policy curriculum? Well, we, we've taken the decision in all of our photos and um, uh, videos to try and remain as, as true to the uh, uh, national standard and, and, and bikeability as, as possible. Um, certainly, when you're representing bikeability, I'd encourage people to be doing, doing the same. But obviously, everyone needs to come to their own um so own decision on uh, on that but i uh, yeah, really encourage everyone if you're representing bikeability um then the images need to represent it as as well um for uh, integrity and, and expectation uh reasons hopefully that's helpful yeah thanks benjamin um so if we're happy we'll move on we've got a final q a right at the end um but now we are uh, want to make you do a little bit of work first so oh i have gone too far sorry everyone too many things open so um off the back of all of those 10 tips um we want to kind of get your brains working about how uh, you could make these work for yourselves. Um, so I want you to think about one success story that you can share with all of us here today. Um, for example, have you taught a record number of children in your area this year? Um, have you got a really personal story of a bikeability student that you wish more people knew about? Um, or an instructor that you want to shout about and say uh, that they've been recognized and say what's great about them um, or anything else. Um, it could be, it doesn't have to necessarily be bikeability related. Um, so who should know about it? So there's probably lots of people who already know about the success. Maybe people internally in your organization know about it. People who are signed up to your newsletter, um, or you might have posted it on um, other channels, on your website, for example, or as a blog post. But now think about how many people don't know about it and why they don't know about it. Is that because they're not subscribed to your newsletter? Is that because they don't go on your website? Is that because they don't read the local newspaper? And whether social media is something that you could use to then reach those people. So appreciate you might need a few minutes to think about this um, and um, start to think about what, what your shiny example is. This is your opportunity to um, show off and uh, impress us with something amazing that's happening in your area. Um, but now I'd like you to share the story and you can share that as a sentence. You can share that as a photograph. Um, Try and use our top tips to see how you might grab our attention. Would you do it as an interview? Would you share it on your channels as a video? Um, and for bonus points, and again, you don't have to do this now, um, but post it on social media. Um, we, we had somebody earlier saying that, you know, most of what stops them is, is the fear of doing it wrong. And I think you've just got to kind of go for it fundamentally if it's a story that you tell a colleague or a story that you tell a friend that you're really proud of you can post it on social media you're not going to have a backlash it's it's not going to be negative um so share it tag our accounts um and uh we'll we'll share it as well and uh it will be hopefully a positive thing but if any of you have got something to share now um Please share it in the chat. Hopefully there are people thinking away furiously. Yes. <laughs> Perhaps you've got one, Derek, that you could uh, you could share with everybody that you um, you think is a is a good example. Uh I think it's just about, I suppose, in these times of in the present, it's if you're actually still doing the training, even just actually yeah. getting out there that you're actually still training. It's just those little bits. That's a big thing. I know I've, I've actually been keen to emphasize it within York is basically we're actually out there still training. We're back in schools. Yeah, you're looking out for us. 
Uh, it's nothing different to what we actually did, but it's just keeping it out there that we do it. And it's been interesting when we've had people come past us saying, oh, it's great to see you back out again doing this, because it's yeah. that, to, to some of the people who just cycle around York all the time, it's just that normality. And they said, oh, yeah, we've seen what you said, and you're out. And we're just quite happy to say it. We've had people asking us about when's their school going to start after we put it out there about other schools, so we're getting messages well, when's my kid's school going to start this one? Going, well, yeah, you'll have to get your school to actually encourage us to go back in again. So it's just those little tips, really. Just just keep it out there, what you're doing. And I think it's that thing about just making sure you keep your service out there, what you're actually doing to actually deliver bikeability throughout out the term time as well it just keeps it in people's minds it's just ticking there in the background that's one of the ways to actually do it as well absolutely and louise has said something similar so she's put in um the success of continuing to deliver bikeability during covid times yeah. children outside getting fresh air and exercise and having the best day ever at school and you can just see that picture in your mind can't you of those kids on their bikes having a wonderful time and how that would really set off that message um, we've got a great story here from Kate, training at school recently, head teacher accompanied group because of the rider needing help. And he'd not done cycling since he last had a bike 40 years ago. And then he passed all of his bike ability levels and was very proud. That's another lovely story that um, I didn't know about and uh, would definitely be something that we'd want to put on our social media channels. And I, I think, Tina, your point is, is a great one as well in terms of sharing feedback um, that, that comes through. Um, you know, that, that, um, there's so many fantastic stories and um, in, in so many different ways in, in, through feedback. So, yeah, getting that message back out to people and sharing it um, is a great idea. And yeah. another wonderful one from David about a teacher that trained as an instructor delivered at several schools and helped boost bookings by pushing it at PE Leeds meetings. And that's something that we know that we need to uh, help you with a little bit more of an industry. So we've got a campaign planned uh, for kind of April time that's about instructors and about a recruitment based campaign and retention campaign. We know it's been a very challenging year, but there's something that we can help you with about shining a light on those amazing instructors and those fantastic stories and helping you shout about them. Yeah, David also mentioned just that thing about the e-cargo delivery of training bikes for school courses as well. Something that's a little bit different, just ca catch the imagination as well. So it's just looking at little the bits like that. Uh, so that, that's good as well. And Louise mentioned about having been out doing level three training. It feels really useful at that age for the children. It's that feedback as well to get the older children involved about why level three is important and gives them that independence as well. And Sue said we've trained over 50,000 children in Cumbria over the last 14 years, which is an amazing figure. Um, and that she did tweet about it and it got a great response. So Again, hopefully that's some reassurance that actually be proud and shout about your achievements and they, they will be really positively received. And, and I think, again, another another comment about, um, uh, you know, building confidence and showing that um, delivery continues during current times. Um, I think, uh, you know, we've talked about that already, but um, the other thing about bikeability is, you know, just to sort of um, uh, get the message across about the fun, how fun it is and, and keeping those sort of levels of interest and energy around the whole, the whole program is really important as well, I think. And another lovely story from Tina about instructors who found cycles and um, done them up for adults so that they could learn to ride with a cycle, um, all done for free. And that reminds me of a story you told me the other day, Derek, about um, your training that you were doing for refugees, which, again, is is an amazing story that we need to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I like, that's what we we're talking about yesterday. I'd have to, have to talk to you about how we do it. That's anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 
Kate puts to a question about uh, delivering more level fees to secondary schools. And again, I think sometimes it's I've seen it on the social media where people are doing it. It gives you an angle to go into the school. But also something we do to engage secondary schools is it's still part of the training. Uh, we, we go in and do assemblies, tell the kids about it's been safe on the roads. And the kids engage by that road safety aspect about their steps along their journey for actually travelling around and being independent. So if you want to email me uh, afterwards, because my email will come at the end, just email me, Kate. I'll talk a bit more about that if you want. But I, I, th I think, you know, one of the, um, well, we know, all know the challenges of getting into secondary schools and, you know, through social media, if you can actually get some stories of people who've done level three training of sort of peer to peer um, recommendations and, and um, that, that can always help boost interest, I think, mm -hmm. just uh, people who've had it, done it and, and realise the importance of it. Which is connected to what Emily said. So pupil who are special, who are special needs and had been unable to cycle. And now that he's passed all of his level levels he encourages others at his school with special needs to take part in the training and I think that's also what it's about it's about turning those people into ambassadors into spokespeople about what you're doing um, and making the most of that I mean if your pupil would be comfortable doing something on social media saying about what a wonderful time he'd had think about how many more children with special needs he could reach beyond just his school and how that that would be really great um, it's something that we want to do with the SEND pilots, uh, so the funding is um, open for that at the moment, closing on the 6th of January. Um, we will be sending out people uh, from the Bikeability Trust to capture some images, to get some stories on those pilots, so that we can then further promote uh, the hard work that, that people are doing with regards to SEND. Yep, and, and another question there, Emily, you were asking about how providers um, interested in stories of how providers get into secondary schools to carry out training. Um, that's something that's come up um, a few times in discussions on our advisory group. Um, and again, I think, um, you know, that's um, next year, we, we, we want to do a lot more case studies. Um, and so, you know, that that's definitely an area that's on our on our list um, to develop some case studies and, and media content around that. So amazing. I'm going to leave that there. Um, my challenge to you, I'll say again, is uh, to turn all of those fantastic stories um, into um, into the kind of, oh, no, we've got one more question. So I will stop and answer that one. Sorry. Uh, Jan saying, I've been teaching asylum seekers funded by a local charity, a real good news story to help them with access that they otherwise don't have. Yeah. Uh, but the training is free to them and has potential to upset the local population. Any ideas how to get around this? Derek, this, this does make me think of, of your training. Um, is this something that you've encountered as well? It is, and that really answers it in one sense. It's, we, haven't, we were having a chat yesterday, uh, we and the other lady do social media, and we weren't sure how we'd get around it because of that upsetting the local population sometimes. And it's... Yeah, it's good, but it's just, how do we do it? We've just done it as flagged it up. If you look at our social media feed, we're just doing it as adult training. Uh, it, and it, it, it suppose it goes back to uh, Andy Tucker's thing about uh, what about if you go off piece with things, and that's where we thought it could actually go off piece a little bit and get some quite negative interaction with it if people came in with that viewpoint so we decided we'll keep it just as just as adults that's how we've done it uh that way because it is that fine balance and i suppose because the fact i work for local authority as well it's really following what guidance we've got in place and if and if you're not working for local authority you might be able to do something and field uh, the response is differently, but it is areas of like that, and it's that's feeling it's feeling your way through it to be honest and uh, see what's good, uh, what's right, and what would work for you. Uh, so that's that side of it, and that's where we ended up with our discussion yesterday. Yeah, we'll do it as adults on our social media feeds for now. If people see us about, see if we get any feedback with that, because at the end of the day, it, we, we had to ourselves we're just training adults it doesn't matter where they've actually come from it's part of our urban cycle type of training and the links are there on our 
uh, Twitter link to if you see us training and you want to do something, the, the link's there and it's open for everybody. So it's not just for that particular group. I know where you're coming from. We're trying to flag it up as being a good news story as well. And that's the fine balance I've actually had in the past working in social care. Uh, working with refugees as well, where we've had, we've actually done it through our comms team about what we've been doing positively around other things, not cycling. So it is that fine balance between the two and not opening yourselves up for too much criticism because that's the thing with uh, social media platforms. You can get all the other side of it, it uh, people coming in and actually trying to diss what you're doing. But also what I'd say to that is um, to be a bit brave at the same time um you know it's a positive story at the end of the day it's a fantastic story why not focus on it from a case study point of view about the individual as opposed to the program or as Derek said look at it as adult training um is the fact that it's free something you want to promote in some areas absolutely you want to shout about the fact you're providing this free service in other areas maybe that's a little bit more uh, something to be cautious over so it depends on on those kind of local feelings um but also i would say that there's a there's a mute button and a block button for a reason and not not to be afraid of that if you get frankly trolls um on your accounts who aren't cycling fans who are just there to start around don't be afraid to just just block them and, and move on because um that's not appropriate to be on your channel and, and i don't think you should be afraid of that um, I would say that the reality of when that's happened, I think that's happened once in my whole six, seven years career of working in social media that I've had to use the block button. It really doesn't happen as often as people perhaps are scared that it does. Um, so but then when it if it does happen, then um, then deal with it accordingly. And yeah, you've always got a comms team or us on hand to support as well. But um, yeah, don't be scared of it. <laughs> Um, so we've got a um, chance for some final Q&As, um, although we've kind of started to go into that already. Um, we've got just a couple of minutes left and I don't want to uh, keep you all from your rainy Fridays. Um, but if you do have any more burning questions, please pop them into the chat. Um, and in the meantime, I'll just pop up our contact details as well um, so that you um, you can email any of us specifically about anything that's come up today um, that you might want a bit more of a kind of one-to-one -one personal answer for. And uh, whilst we're just waiting to see if we've got any last minute questions, although hopefully, it looks like uh, we've resolved most of that. Um, I will just uh, say, as I do every week for this autumn webinar series, when this session ends, uh, you'll be met with a survey and it will be really helpful if you could just take a couple of minutes to fill that in. Um, any feedback that you've got, both about the content of this webinar and how the webinar series has worked as a whole is really, really useful for us. Um, we'll also be sending out a uh, survey to everybody whether they've attended the webinars or not um, to gather some feedback but specifically for this webinar if you can answer that once uh, once we close the session today that will be really helpful for us. And, and I should just say, you know, I'm, I'm sure all of us have um, looking at the questions and the responses that you've you've all contributed to. Um, there's been some really useful points there that we'll go back and we're going to have a debrief after this and, and, and run through those and um, some really useful points that we'll be picking up on and coming back to you on um, as an industry. So thank you for all your input. And thank you to everybody uh, putting their thanks in the chat as well. Um, and glad to glad to hear that you've learned some valuable tips. Um, this is definitely something that we want to build on and, and do some more communications and promotion webinars in the future. So, um, yeah, it's great to hear that it's been helpful for you. And as Chris says, have a Merry Christmas, because this is the last webinar session before Christmas. So um, season's greetings to everybody. And uh, we look forward to seeing you for some more webinar sessions in the new year. Thank you. Thank you.